Hello and welcome. Thank you for participating in Moorhead at Home Skywatching, hosted by Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. My name is Amy Sale and I'm an educator at Moorhead. We are a unit of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, located on campus. And we also work throughout the state through a number of outreach initiatives like our mobile lab vans, summer camp programs, and the annual North Carolina Science Festival. Our mission is to help people better understand science, technology, and health. And we do this through engaging learning opportunities like this live virtual event. We're glad to have you here for our program on See the International Space Station and my colleague Nick will get us started. Hey everybody, welcome to Moorhead at Home. Thanks for being here with us today. Uh, even though we can't see you in person, we get really excited to see you virtually on our Tuesday and Thursday programs. So as Amy mentioned today, we're going to be diving into a topic um, that some of us um, might be familiar with and some of us might not. We're going to be talking all about the International Space Station. So before we get into it and describe a little bit of what we're going to do today, we had a question for you. So we're going to pop up a poll question here. Um, and you have a couple of options. The question is, have you ever seen the International Space Station? Answers are yes, no, or I'm not sure. So we kind of wanted to see uh, what you're thinking about this. Um, and there's probably a few different ways you could think to answer it. You might have seen pictures, you might have seen it in the sky, uh, you might have seen it um, in another presentation. So take a moment and give us your ideas. Um, and, if, and if you're not sure, don't hesitate to say I'm not sure. So what about you, Nick? Have you seen the International Space Station? I have seen the International Space Station um, kind of in all of those ways, um, through research, in the real sky. Um, you see it fly over the Earth, but we'll talk all about uh, how that happens. OK, so we got our results here. It looks like a little over half of us, 55%, have seen the International Space Station. 41% uh, said no, and 7% said I'm not sure. So I think that's actually a pretty great mix. Um, and we hope that today uh, the, the sort of topics we're going to talk about will help you uh, see it before too long. So on that note, let me describe a little bit about what we're going to do. Um, in past sessions, if you've been with us for Moorhead at Home, we've used a software called Stellarium. It's a really fantastic software for looking at the nighttime sky. But we're going to use something different today. So um, we'll put it in the chat for y'all, uh, but the program we're gonna use is called NASA's Eyes. So this is a program from NASA. You can download it on your PC or Mac. Um, there's not a mobile app, unfortunately, but it's a way to visualize and um, interact with real NASA data. So I will say, along with my job at the Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center, I also volunteer with NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory as something called a solar system ambassador. And that might sound really fancy, but all it really means is that I get to talk to people about all the cool missions that are going on out there in space right now and then relay that information to folks like you. So I'm really excited to show you this because um, eyes is a way that you can really see what NASA is doing. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen for you. Um, and that way you'll be able to see kind of what I'm looking at here. Let me adjust it for us so that we have a really good view. There we go. So you should be seeing a window um, that has a few different components to it. Right in the middle, you see our beautiful blue marble, the Earth. That's our home planet. And I even have it pointed right towards North America right now. Um, it's totally possible that somebody watching today is not right here in North America. The cool thing about this is you can spin it around. Um, so it's kind of like we have our own bird's eye view of, of our planet Earth. Um, and I will say there are a few different um, components to NASA's eyes. The one that we're using today is called NASA's Eyes on Earth. Um, because when we talk about the International Space Station, we're, we're focusing on something that um, is in orbit around our Earth. And I think it's a misconception, or um, another word for misconception is wrong idea, that um, NASA only looks out in space. As you can see here, these orbit lines show satellites that are doing observations of our Earth. So NASA does a lot of Earth science, too. When we study our own home planet, it gives us a better perspective and a better vantage point to understand what's out there uh, further along in the solar system and in our galaxy and in the universe. So um, Earth observing happens a lot at NASA. So even though it can be kind of confusing and overwhelming to see all of these lines, there is one in particular that we're going to focus on. You might have seen it. 
kind of passing over the southern tip of South America. It says ISS, that's the abbreviation for the International Space Station. So um, you might notice that if you see this white line here, it is orbiting around our Earth, um, but in the real world, you wouldn't see that big line up there in space. Uh, one of the really neat things about NASA's eyes is that we can get an up close look um, of these satellites. So hold on to your seats. As you can see here, it says click to zoom. I'm gonna click that. And if you want more information, feel free to look over at these windows that pop up as we move around in here today. But for now, we're gonna zoom in on the International Space Station. And as you can see, this is a pretty good up close view. I'm gonna to try to not move my camera too much so that y'all can um, kind of take it in and, and, and look at all the different components there. But I was wondering if Amy can maybe tell us a little bit about what the International Space Station does. Yeah, so um, as y'all look at your screen, um, it may look like the screen is sort of jerking a little bit. Of course, the ISS is moving continuously. Um, but you'll see that it is moving. Um, it's an orbiting laboratory. It orbits Earth um, about 250 miles above the surface of Earth. Now, as a comparison, if you've ever flown in an airplane, that airplane was probably flying around six or seven miles above Earth. And the space station is 250. 50 miles above Earth. Um, and I noticed some of you have already taken advantage of the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions while we're talking, type in your questions. Um, and I saw that somebody had a question about how long it had been up there. In terms of um, humans living and working continuously on it, it has been almost 20 years. Now, no one human has been on for that entire time. So there's different crews that come up um, and that will inhabit the space station for, you know, generally months at a time. So it's Expedition 63 that's up there right now, three people, and they're going to be joined later this month by two more. Um, this is an international collaboration. It's called the International Space Station because it's a collaboration of a number of space agencies, including the U.S. Space Agency, uh, Russians, Europe, Japan, Canada. Um, astronauts from many countries have visited the space station and there have been thousands of research investigations that have been done on the space station. So there is science happening on the space station. And um, it, it's both the experiments that they're doing inside of it, where in their, in their quarters, but also if you look closely, um, you'll see some labels on the space station itself indicating different scientific instruments. And it looks like Nick is uh, highlighting some in particular. Do you want to say anything about one of those? Sure, yeah. It's kind of lucky that we have the label for one of these on here. I'm going to spin us around so that we can see it a little closer, and I'll zoom in for us. Um, the one that I want you all to look at is called OCO3. Um, that stands for Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3. Um, uh, OCO2 is a satellite that is in orbit around our Earth right now still, um, giving us data all about um, carbon dioxide, or CO2 on the earth, but they decided that they wanted to be able to observe that even more. So they uh, uh, installed a unit that kind of looks like a big refrigerator here uh, on the side of the International Space Station so that we can uh, observe more parts of the earth and understand um, carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases in general, and, and what humans are doing to our atmosphere. So um, it's really neat. You can click on these individual uh, parts of the spacecraft and you see um, that they can kind of tell us um, a little more detail about those parts. Another thing, you know, we'll jump away from the space station right now is if you want to see maps of uh, this data that comes from these spacecraft, you can look at that. Up here at the top of your NASA eyes window, you have uh, information about temperature and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and sea level and all sorts of things that can give you a bigger picture of what these observations do for us and teach us about our Earth. And you see that there's lots of learning you can do over here on the side. I will not read all of that out for you right now, um, but we definitely encourage y'all to download this program and try it out because I've learned a lot from it. Um, and, and I bet you can too. But for now, we're going to go back to our ISS, and it's as easy Nick, as that. I see a, a question from Katie, um, who's just curious. Who um, can we? Is it okay if we can we zoom back in? Sure. Um, Katie had a question about the instrument that was that was called EcoStress, and was just wondering what that meant. I wonder if we could click on it to just see um, what the name of that is. 
Sure. Yeah. So NASA really, really loves to make uh, acronyms, which are uh, basically words out of uh, letters that stand for things. Um, so like ISS stands for International Space Station. EcoStress stands for the Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station, which is probably why they decided to call it EcoStress instead. Um, but it actually uh, measures the temperatures of plants. So um, of course, you could read this over here um, and for yourself and maybe look up EcoStress and do a little bit of research on when they installed it on the space station, what it's doing, what we've learned from it. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that that's the other one that's labeled because many of these other parts here are their own scientific instruments. And Nick, I see that Grace has a question about how big is the International Space Station? And so I wondered if we could give people an idea. About Absolutely. The scale of it. So if we click back on ISS, you might have noticed over here on the left hand side of your screen, there's a compare size window. And you can actually compare the size of the International Space Station to a couple of different things. So first, let's try to compare it to a scientist, so a human being. And I clicked that. You might not be able to see it, but she is right here. There's our scientist. You can't even see a lot of detail. Maybe I'll zoom in just a little bit. Nick, I'm worried about our scientist. It looks like she might not be uh, tethered to the space station or wearing a spacesuit. I know. Well, you know, astronauts do go outside the space station for what we call spacewalks or uh, EVAs, extravehicular activity, um, but they would be wearing their spacesuit and they would uh, be properly connected to the space station. So again, this is just an example, but yeah, she's, she's not being very safe up there right now. So a human being is pretty small compared to the size of the International Space Station. Um, here in NASA's eyes, we can actually compare it to something else too. Should we try it? Let's do it. There we go. You might oh, remember. that's something that looks familiar. A school bus. And we did not launch a school bus into space. Um, as funny as that might be, this is just used as a comparison, but um, maybe that's something that y'all are familiar with. If you've been on your school bus before, you know that it's a pretty big vehicle. Um, but compared to the overall size of the International Space Station, to me, it still looks kind of small. And another comparison um, that often gets used is that it's roughly the size of a football field. So I like to think of it as a flying football field orbiting Earth. And um, there's also a number of questions about how fast it's going. Um, it is traveling at about 17,500 miles per hour. So over 17,000 miles per hour, if uh, you want to make another comparison to airplanes, they're more like 600 miles per hour. And I, I will mention that um, I didn't tell you all this at the beginning, but you can change the speed in this program. Uh, this is real time, one second per second. But watch this. If I speed it up, we can go one minute per second. And you start to notice things kind of change both on the Earth below and with the space station itself. You can see we start to kind of fly over some land. You might notice that those big solar panels kind of look like they're moving or rotating. Well, they're trying their best to still point towards the sun. So you notice that we're on the dark side of the International Space Station right now. Um, and those panels, uh, that's, how, that's how the space station gets a lot of its energy uh, is from those big solar panels. Okay, and I see there was a question, I, I think from Hannah about those solar panels. Oh, good. So yes, those are solar panels. Okay, oh, and then somebody asks um, if this is actually where it is in orbit, like right now. So I think you've actually gone forward a little bit in time. I was forward, but you know, I just hit that button that says real time. Oh, just went back, okay. And that took us back to right now. So this is where the space station is over the Earth right now. Um, so that might be kind of a good lead in for us, Amy, to talk about how we can see the space yeah. station. because. As nice as it would be to be out here in space with a, a bird's eye view, um, this is some of that special NASA magic. Right, so you can actually see the space station. Um, it makes visible passes. So again, it's orbiting about 250 miles off the surface of Earth. It is in outer space. It is going over 17,000 miles per hour. And this means that it is going around Earth every 90 minutes. Now you're not gonna be able to see it every 90 minutes. like. For example, if it was passing over us right now as we speak live at 10.50 in the morning, 
probably not a good time to see it because you need, need a couple of things to be going on. One is that you need it to be relatively dark where you are so that you can actually make it out against the dark sky. And you also need it to be in light. So it doesn't make its own light. It shines by reflected sunlight. So what all that means is that you're going to see the space station uh, best if it's within, if it's making a visit, if it's making a pass within a few hours after sunset or within a few hours before sunrise. And um, it looks like a bright white moving star. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, but we wanted to show you there's actually a number of really good visible passes coming up for North Carolina. Um, and I know not all of you uh, watching are in North Carolina. So we'll, um, we're gonna, Nick is gonna take us to another website and help you figure out how to find out when you can see the space station in the sky. So he's switching from NASA eyes and he's gonna go to uh, NASA's spot the station site. Um, and we'll put that URL in the chat. Um, it's spotthestation.nasa.gov. And that just went into the chat, if you're curious about that. And you'll you see, see our window there, Amy. Yeah, I see the window. It looks good. I'm seeing on the right, for example, it says head, heads up alerts where you can sign up to get email or text alerts when the space station is flying over your location. And then I see in the middle what looks like a map. And you can type in uh, your location. It happens to already know that Nick's computer is in Chapel Hill. We'll pick Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And by the way, we also know that all of you in North Carolina who are watching this are not necessarily in Chapel Hill, as long as with, you're within, well, a pretty good range <laughs> of Chapel Hill, all this information is gonna apply. Um, the space station tonight, for example, is actually passing over Florida and then kind of over the ocean uh, off the east coast of the US, and you can see it from Chapel Hill, from Durham, from Raleigh, and so on. Okay, so um, once we've got the, we've got that little sort of blue marker, um, Nick, I wonder if you could click that. And then it says view sighting opportunities. So he's gonna click that. And then it's gonna pop up a whole bunch of sightings um, for May 6th through May 22nd. So if you're watching this live, it is Thursday, May 14th. So if you look on the left-hand column under date, you'll see a couple of entries for May 14th. Now 4.55 in the morning, um, we already missed that, but we've got one coming up, 9.36 p.m. And uh, if you look at the next column, it says it'll be visible for four minutes. It generally takes a few minutes to work its way across the sky from your point of view. It says max height. 37 degrees. So let's talk about what that means. Maximum height above the horizon. 37 degrees. Okay, so if you're watching me, I'm going to show you, try to show you with my hands what we're talking about when we talk about angles. So the horizon where the sky appears to meet the ground, that's zero degrees. The top of the sky is 90 degrees. And if you've studied angles in schools, you know that this is a 90 degree angle. So horizon zero, Top of the sky, 90 degrees. So halfway of the sky would be 45 degrees. 37 degrees would be a little bit between a third and halfway up the sky. So that's where it'll be at its highest. It says it appears for Thursday, May 14th, it appears at 10 degrees above the horizon in the south southwest. Now I wouldn't sweat it too much if you don't have a compass, you're not totally clear on the directions. If you know more about your neighborhood, you know where the sun sets, that's going to be more or less the west. South Southwest is more or less the South. Um, and I'll be honest, it can be hard to spot it when it's only 10 degrees above the horizon because you might have a house in the way, trees in the way for sure. And also it's a little bit dimmer and it doesn't appear to be moving as fast when it's kind of climbing out of the horizon. So you may find it easier to see when it's near its maximum height, about a third of the way up the sky. Um, this particular pass, you'll probably want to be looking south. That'll be the when you're most likely to see it. And it'll, it'll be very bright, not as bright as Venus, but brighter than any star that you'll see in the night sky. Okay, and Nick, I don't know, there's been questions popping up and um, I don't know if we need to add anything based on what people are asking. 
Well, let's take a look. Um, yeah, we just wanted to show you all this resource because we use it all the time. Uh, before our sky watching sessions, before our planetarium shows, we always check spotthestation.nasa.gov uh, because this is such a cool way to connect with something that's actually out there in space. Um, and I know um, some of the questions might address this as well, but um, when we look at the space station, there are human beings on there. Right now there are three, three people up on the space station. So what I always do when it passes overhead and I catch it is I wave. Um, it's unlikely that they can see me, but um, it makes me feel nice that human beings are up there and compared with all those other satellites uh, orbiting around the earth, it's the only one with humans on it. Yeah, and um, somebody asked about how many people had been on it. Um, I found a, um, just a blog post on the NASA site from less than a month ago that said that 239 people from 19 different countries have visited the space station. But again, only three on right now and two more about to join them. Um, and by the way, there has been somebody who calls North Carolina her home who has been on the space station. And um, that is a woman named Christina Cook who um, has a couple degrees from NC State. She was on the International Space Station for, I wanna check, I think it was 328 days in a row. And she actually set a record for longest space flight um, by a woman when she did that. Okay, Nick, are you seeing more questions coming up? Oh, I wanted to mention actually when that list of um, passes coming up, Though there was a really good one Saturday night for uh, North Carolina, um, right around the same time as the one tonight. So if the weather is clear for you, definitely check that out. And um, I will say, I also know there's at least one person watching from out of state from Arizona, and you have a number of good space station passes coming up as well. I do see lots of good questions. Um, and I think I'll, I'll address one. Um, that's kind of kind of applies to what's happening in the world right now. The question was, have the images from the space station been different since COVID has kept people at home? So we know we're all at home right now. Um, it's interesting to think about how images of the Earth could change. But the tricky thing is a lot of times when those instruments on the space station or other satellites take images, it takes a little while for them to be processed and for the scientists to understand that information. So I would say as of right now, we do have live looks at the Earth. Um, but what this change and how we're all at home and maybe driving less and things like that, what that looks like for the Earth, we won't know for a little while. Um, it'll be months and months of analysis and kind of digging into the data that we get from these spacecraft before we know for sure what kind of changes happen. But I think that's a really great question and a really good hypothesis because that same question you asked, that's what the scientists are asking themselves right now too. So can't give you a big concrete answer on that, but it'll be interesting to see how things have changed. And Nick, if I can follow up on that, I see that um, uh, six-year-old Sophie um, has a, a related question wanting to know how coronavirus is affecting the space station. Are the people staying there? Um, Sophie, I was just reading about the crew that's about to launch there um, and they have gone into quarantine um, because they need to make sure that they are healthy before they go, because you definitely wouldn't want to bring a disease to your crewmates on the International Space Station. And by the way, astronauts always do this. It's not just because coronavirus. Astronauts go into quarantine before they um, join other astronauts because they don't want to get anybody sick. Great question. I see a question um, that's related um, from Eloise. How many satellites are in space right now? So I don't have an exact number for you, but there are thousands of satellites, um, both working and no longer working, that are in orbit around our Earth or beyond. Um, so there are some spacecraft, like the Voyager spacecraft and the Pioneer spacecraft, that are really, really far out in space, you know, beyond the orbit of Pluto in our solar system. But as you could tell from when we first looked at Earth, there are lots of things in orbit around the Earth, too. Um, so I always think that this is um, a good reason that we need to be careful when we're launching things into space. Um, some of those satellites that are working and not working um, are considered space junk, mostly the ones that are not working. Um, so um, it's interesting because humans have put a lot of things out there. Um, and I don't have an exact number for satellites, but I bet, I bet we could look it up. Um, but they're in the thousands. And um, Nick, uh, just to clarify, we've got a question from Lindsay about, can you see the space station with your eyes or do you need a telescope? And uh, that reminds 
mention more about exactly what it looks like and what it doesn't look like. So first off, yes, you can see it with just your eyes. It is very bright. It will look brighter than the stars that you're seeing at night. Um, it will, I think it looks like a bright moving star. It will possibly be moving. Um, there's a few things not for though. Um, it should not look like an airplane. So if you see red light, green light, or flashing light, that is not a space station, that is probably an airplane. Um, something that moves really fast, like poof, streaks across the sky, you know, um, like you're with a group of people and somebody says, ooh, and then you turn and look and it's already gone. That's not the International Space Station either. It's probably not an airplane either. That was probably a meteor, also known as a shooting star. Uh, let's think, anything else not to mistake it for? Oh, don't mistake it for a planet. Um, so Venus is still up in the early evening um, in the west after sunset and Venus is very bright, but over a few minutes, Venus is not gonna noticeably appear to move. Um, the space station noticeably moves. In fact, most people um, that I've talked to when they see the space station for the first time, they report that it moved faster than they were expecting. Um, and we've actually seen, I'm gonna make a plug for our Skywatch team. Once they come back, we can't hold them right now because they're have um, in the past have looked out and had sky watching sessions happening when the International Space Station was making a really good visible path. So there's been a couple of times that we got to wave hello to Christina Cook and space when she was on the space station. Uh, hundreds of people all waving together. Now I'll add something to that. Um, you can see other satellites too. So the space station is one of the brightest and one of the most interesting um, a lot of the times uh, since there are people on it and we know it goes around the earth every 90 minutes. But sometimes when you're stargazing, you might notice other things are shining steadily and moving across the sky that aren't airplanes and aren't planets and aren't stars. Um, so um, there's a number of resources that you can use to figure out what those satellites are. It takes some, um, uh, it takes some, research a lot of the time to figure out exactly what it was that was moving overhead at your house at a specific time, but um, they're not always the space station. So uh, maybe you can compare and contrast and tell the difference and try to tell the difference. Yeah, one of the most fun things that it's, it's a little tricky to see because it's dim is the Hubble Space Telescope actually does make visible passes. Um, and I see a question from Corey. How do people get on and off the space station? How do they come and go? Yeah, good point, right? Because it's orbiting in space. How do you get there? It's not like you can teleport. Um, so with spacecraft, you have to launch off of Earth and then dock with the space station and go on. And um, the happening later this month is, um, and it hasn't happened in a while, we're launching from the US. Um, it's been Russia lately that's been doing it. So there are going to be two American astronauts launching Space Center, International Space Station on a Falcon 9 rocket and a SpaceX spacecraft. Awesome. Uh, another great question here. Does anything ever break on the International Space Station? And if so, how do they fix the problem? Well, um, a number of astronauts who've been up on the space station before have described their job as kind of being like a mechanic. Um, that's one thing that every astronaut, no matter if they're a biologist or um, an astrophysicist or a teacher or, or whatever, whatever their profession is, all of them kind of have to be mechanics when they go up onto the International Space Station because if something breaks, whether it's um, your um, communications back to Earth or your toilet, whatever it might be, the astronauts have to fix those things themselves. Um, so things do break. There are unexpected challenges, but that's part of why training for an astronaut takes so long. Um, and it takes a really special set of skills because they have to be able to problem solve and fix those things um, whenever they do break. So don't worry, the toilets are not broken right now. Uh, but a couple months back, uh, there was maybe some news that you read that the toilets on the space station weren't working anymore. Um, and that can seem kind of scary, but they fixed them. And, and, and don't worry, everything is pretty sanitary up there, too. Well, Nick, I think we're out of time. So um, we'll get our topics for the next couple of weeks up on our calendar really soon. And we hope to see you all next Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern.
Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, if you want more information about what Moorhead is doing during, during this time, please check out our website, www.moorheadplanetarium.org. You can uh, navigate your way to the Moorhead at Home page there. Um, we're also on social media, uh, Twitter at Moorhead Planet, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Um, on our YouTube page, we actually have virtual playlists um, that include 360 planetarium shows and all sorts of cool stuff that you can watch um, for free on YouTube at your house. So even though we can't see you in person on campus right now, uh, we'd like to give you some, some fun things to do uh, from home. So um, we'll see you next Tuesday. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everybody.